come up with in a million years that Shiva Ray would do or something. It was what posture could I put between these other two postures, making it an all levels class. So for the most part, that's what that center posture will prove as, um, or it will prove as like a segue moving us over you know, into another idea. Uh, so let's let's just play around. So here is um, Sammy's Mountain that we did at Hollywood Palms the other day for her yoga gigs with Sobe. She makes my job so incredibly easy. And so the whole theme behind this photo shoot, and uh, they, will, they will be featured in the fall in September, I believe. The whole theme behind it is you can, you can do yoga anywhere, no matter what you wear. And so, you know, that also includes on my blog post on the site that you don't need expensive yoga classes or even a yoga studio for that matter to do yoga. You can do yoga anywhere. And then building on that idea is that the asanas are only one of eight postures. Now, putting Sammy in a gold dress in a beautiful uh, backdrop with a red carpet, I think makes it easier to share that message as far as an attention getting message. So that is the goal of this particular photo shoot. Um, so this was a beautiful venue and I'm excited about sharing these with you as, as time goes on as we do these different ones. But you know, mo most first things first, let's look at the alignment here. Uh, depending on what your students are wearing to class, you can't always see what's going on. So if they have really baggy pants, for example, um, you, you might not see that they're locking their knees. And so that might be just a verbal cue that you just sprinkle in, you know, not every single class, but maybe, you know, every handful, every few, once a week or whatever, you know. Uh, one thing we see here is a, a nice neutral gaze, a dristi looking forward, that's Sanskrit for gaze, looking forward, rather than her head coming back with the gaze up or her chin tucked down. And so that's a really nice cue to bring in for folks. Um, I think that finding that, that upper body posture now more than ever will be highlighted at edge because so many folks are sitting in front of a computer and a screen all day and looking down or looking up or looking however. Um, I do wonder how all this light is going to affect our eyesight. Are we all gonna end up with glasses on the other side of this? I'm not sure. But um, <clears throat> some other key things as, as we move our way in mountain, when I cue mountain, I don't really cue it top down. I might mention that um, Dristi is gaze forward just to kind of get them centered. But then I generally cue mountain from feet up. And I know that sometimes I hear um, some lingo that mountain is one of the easiest postures and that you can just do a mountain or whatever. But yeah, you know, some say just suggest the mountain is the most advanced posture of them all. And, you know, I, I have to say that I'm in align with, alignment with that in that if you're cueing your yogi from the soles of their feet, and maybe perhaps, you know, you're setting up their feet to be under their knees. So we've gotten, we've gotten that, or maybe you've chosen big toes to touch, whichever you like, you know, and then, and then maybe we, we invite them to lift the arches some. And if we've done that and we know our anatomy, then we also know that there's an activation of the gracilis muscles, the inner thigh muscles right, that is supporting this movement. So I wouldn't go into all of that in a yoga class, but as a teacher, it's important that we know. So commonly when we do this though, we might see an external rotation where the knees and the thighs begin to move out. So if the kneecaps were headlights, we would want them to face forward. And if they externally rotated out, then they would kind of go cockeyed to either side of the body, no longer presenting a light path in front of us, right? So just kind of considering that, um, that's a nice go-to for the knees, it's a nice go-to for the hips, it's a nice go-to for the shoulders. Um, also worth saying that Leslie Kamenoff does not like the cue Warrior One, where the, where the shoulders are square over the hips in the 
lights are facing forward because he says it's anatomically impossible. So I don't know, maybe creative differences there. I feel like it gets the job done. It teaches you what you need to know. And while I do understand that if I did attach a light to the front of your hip, it wouldn't go straight forward and that's okay. But it also wouldn't be opening up into a warrior two where one light's going forward and one is going to the side of the wall. So that's essentially what we're looking for in this mountain pose. So let's talk about it. As we move our way up, commonly for most people, the lower leg complex is underdeveloped. And that's one of the largest number one reasons that people fall. And falling is up there on lists of causes of death. Lots of people fall and die. So this is a thing, you know, this is a thing to observe that sometimes perhaps gets um, overlooked a little bit. So as yoga teachers, if we can help our students develop their lower leg complex from their knee down, that we can really serve them in many, many ways. There's also quite a bit of medical suggestion that from the soles of the feet, if we have um, an imbalance there, that that will continue on up the body because you know the, the ankle bone is connected to the knee bone and so on, right? Now that you've got that song stuck in your head for the rest of the day, that as you move your way up, that it's quite likely that we now have an imbalance in the stance of our upper body to include our shoulders and ultimately landing as a crink in our neck based on which way the head tilts. And then that big heavy bowling ball sitting on top of this little cervical spine, which isn't that hardy to start with, if, if not straight up, it's very, very likely that somebody who is experiencing um, knots in their neck or discomfort in their neck or through their upper back, traps, rhomboids there, that the source of that is the soles of the feet. So let's continue it on. If we invite the soles of the feet to draw towards the earth and we include some flowery imagery here, you know, like imagine the soles of the feet are rooted into the earth's surface, grounding you and so on. That's really powerful language because the tendency of the practitioner to translate that into really bringing grounding themselves <clears throat> is high. But when you do it, the likelihood of over cueing them to the point that they forget about keeping those kneecaps lifted. Cause that was, I don't even know how many, how many cues ago did we talk about kneecaps lifted? You know, that was a while back. And so in most cases, many practitioners, by the time they're grounding their soles of their feet are no longer uh, lifting their kneecaps or vice versa. If you're presenting it from ground up. Uh, so, you know, back to the kneecaps, we've got the headlights forward and we're engaging the thighs, right? We're feeling a lift in the thighs, which is so important. These muscles are so big. They have, um, you know, one of the biggest muscle groups in the body going on. And so going to impact things like metabolism. And if you uh, caught Lori's lesson the other day on yoga for type two diabetes, you know, if we have larger muscle groups, then we have a better chance of having um, efficient processing of our foodstuffs and fat burning and all that other kind of stuff. And that leads us down the road towards, you know, uh, an optimal body max into mass index, depending on what's right for you as an individual and your medical team. But things like that go a really long way. And it's just a tiny little cue, but it's a tiny little cue that many people practice every day. So since yoga kind of wins out a little bit on frequency for those who do yoga every damn day, for example, what? since that since that's often the case. This, you don't feel heavy and disgusting all right. Since that's often the case, um, lifting those kneecaps and engaging those thighs can go such a long way for a practitioner that goes back at it again and again and again. So standing and mounted, here we are. We've, uh, we've done so many cues and we haven't even really reached the pelvis yet. So when we look at the pelvis, we want to consider if it were a bowl of water, 
would it tip forward and spill or back and spill? So neutral. And so this is a nice cue to share with your students to give them some idea of what, what you're looking for. Um, if we go with, let's tuck the tail in, for example, um, many times we see like a, a pelvic tilt that we didn't intend to have happen. Um, and then the byproduct of that is those hamstrings shorten right? Um, and we tend to have a, now somewhat of a bend in the knee. And so the result of that, the anatomy behind that is the majority of the, the weight load, generally speaking, in the scenario that I've just given you, would go then to the quads, the front of the thighs. And so if we tie back around to one of the things we want to do is help practitioners build up their lower leg complex knee down, then, um, then I think it's fair to say that we've lost that, right? So keeping them in mind, I do like to circle back around and check back in like, hey, do we still, uh, do we still have those kneecaps engaged? How's that feeling? Which sounds redundant, but I understand as a teacher that if I speak a hundred words, my students might hear might hear 50 of them. And that's that's a gift of a number. Um, but then moments later might return what, 10, 15, 20%, maybe, depending, you know, on if they were paying attention to the moment I was speaking or whatever it was. So the same thing happens in, in a yoga class, you know, I mean, by the time you've got them in their body, which is what you're there to do, then the, the obstacle is how do you also keep them engaged with the cues that you're giving? So, and this is where that, that flower language is really powerful because people want to tune in and want to hear this. And this is a uh, new language and it's entertaining and worth tuning in for. So with that being said, we do want to develop those, those language skills, but we don't want so much of it that we've lost the moral of the story, which I've seen happen so many times too. Uh, so, okay, so where were we? We were only about halfway up at, at the pelvis there, nice and neutral bowl of water, not spilling, tipping forward or back, right? So then as we come up to the abs, if, if we talk about navel to spine, which is in my manual, in many places, navel to spine, it's, in, it works, you know, it gets people thinking about engaging their core, but to build on it, you know, coming into like moving from a cue to a, to a refined advanced quality, you know, once you've kind of got, you know, let's imagine snugging our nails into our spine. Um, I'd rather see that than a tuck of the tailbone. And then maybe talk about, could we wrap the sides of our body towards the navel and then also through the back of the body equally. Could we find that? Could we find like a corset of muscular structure to hold our body up, to help support those feet, to help keep those kneecaps lifted and those thighs engaged, right? So, you know, if we're circling back around in this kind of presentation, we can add more, add more, add more. By now, we've been in mountain a long time. And those that may have come to class thinking, well, oh, you know, you, mountain's an easy posture, hopefully are changing their stance on that, right? Literally, haha. -ha. All right, so then let's move our way up to the rib cage. So the whole goal, as I see it, is to create space for the breath. So if yoga is a breath-centered practice and we want to create space for the breath, then we would want to find uh, an opening of the rib cage, right? But we wouldn't want to do it so much so that we have a, um, an unnatural tug and pull and maybe even with it a shrug that could come oftentimes with opening up that rib cage, you know? So we want to keep a softness through the chat, through the trap. So you might hear me say, let's try and open up that rib cage and make some yummy space for this nice deep breath we're about to take. So beginning with the inhale through the nose and a soft base of the neck, you see how I've threaded that in there? Take a nice deep inhale and inflate those lungs with all the vast space you've created for this breath. Okay, so 
kind of along those lines, we're opening up the rib cage, we're, we're creating space, but we're keeping the base of the neck soft. Now ask yourself, what's the likelihood that your students are paying any attention to the arches of the feet remaining lifted and the inner thighs, the gracilis muscles still activated at this point? And so this is one, one example of many as to, you know, why mountain is such an advanced posture because we just have so much going on. Like essentially we're looking to engage and align everything and then create space for a breath, for some movement. So as we, as we take in that movement, depending on your current breathing patterns, whatever that might be, whatever those are, it's been suggested by Leslie Kamenoff, whatever your current breathing patterns are, just flip it and do something else. So it's not that there's a right or wrong when we come to pranayama, the fifth limbs, but just like asana, there's different approaches to it. And, and the bigger cautionary tale would be not allowing yourself to get stuck in a breath pattern. Right. And so that's also what happens with the skeletal system. So if we tend to, let's say, um, hold a phone and type on a phone all day because that's what we're doing, right? So rounding the back, rounding the shoulders, tucking the chin down, bringing that cervical spine, that neck into flexion by bringing the chin towards the chest. If we're doing that all the time, over time, our spine's going to want to do this. And if you do this your whole life, as you, as you become a senior in age, you'll find you can't move it back, that it's this is now fixed in this position bony bony structure and spurs and things like that start to impact the reasons why that happens but then also the muscular structure that you've developed because your body is a beautiful machine and able to navigate in so many different ways so if you've developed the muscles to support your body in this position that's now the muscular structure that you're dealing with and then add to that the connective tissue that hangs out in between the skeletal system and the muscular system. That's also going to conform. So it'll be short in areas and long in others where maybe we were seeking balance to start with. So the same thing happens with our breathing patterns. So if we're used to taking a breath and, and we're, we are, our posture is just rounded and forward some, and maybe our traps are up a smidge and it doesn't take much, that's greatly going to impact the accessibility of the lungs in regards to the rib cage. So while you wouldn't wanna go into all of that in a yoga class, for example, I do think that that's important to have a strong understanding of, you know, as a yoga teacher and maybe in a six week series, make mountain pose the apex pose rather than say an arm balance. Mountain pose, we're gonna, we're gonna unpack mountain pose in this six week series of hatha yoga or yin yoga or restorative yoga or whatever whatever style you choose mountain hopefully will be there somewhere shows up somewhere uh, so okay so we talked about inflating the lungs and creating space and opening up the chest and keeping everything engaged from the soles of the feet rooted down beneath them and all the way up finding a lengthening of the erector spinae the muscles that hold the spinal column up upright, right? So finding a lengthening there with a nice neutral pelvis so that that lengthening isn't cockeyed because the pelvis is cockeyed because it's all a chain and moving its way from the base of the neck up to the cervical spine, which brings us back to that dristy where we're gazing forward with a nice soft chin rather than gazing up or gazing down even some. What's ahead of me? And that might be a nice time to bring in invitation about what's ahead of me. What am I looking at from today on? <clears throat> because many folks spend their life looking back. And the downside of that is if you're looking back, you are not looking ahead of you. You are not looking in front of you. And <clears throat> if you are looking back, you are not in presence. So in order to take a true dristy where you gaze 
at what is in front of you without movement in a posture such as mountain. And that's why mountain so powerful is that you must be present. And if you're in movement, whether in your mind or in your body or energetically, if you're in movement, your drifty is not going to be able to lock onto one thing because you're moving. So try and maybe sprinkle some of that in to help folks get in the habit of being present. And so let me add in the idea that it can also be a tool in becoming accustomed to being present in that if people come to you, if your students come to you, or even if you feel like the world around you is just spinning, moving, spinning, moving, spinning, moving, right? If their call to action, if there is things to do today is, you know what, for one minute, set a timer on your phone so you don't have to look at your phone for one minute with pretty chimes at the end, just gaze at something for one minute. You know, ideally standing, but hey, I'll take whatever I can get. You hear me say that all the time in training. I'll take whatever I can get. If it's sitting, if it's sitting in between Zoom meetings, I'll still take it. One minute of mindfulness, of presence with the drifty forward locked on to what your eyes bring you to in that moment translates to presence. All right, so with that, I found a nice little resource here that I'll share with you guys. that I really liked. So this is the, the planner that I picked up earlier in the year and um, it's a teacher's edition. So it goes from fall to summer and uh, I don't get paid or I'm not endorsed by these people at all. I just like to share great resources. So if life feels like it's spinning out of control, something like a daily schedule can go such a very long way. And notice that the top priorities are few and the to-do to -do list is many. And so when we're giving cues out, we want to consider that in the same way from that same approach that Ultimately, there's some key cues where we need to practice discernment and say, okay, these are the cues that I, I want to really bring home. Um, but ultimately, in the end, I want to make sure I don't lose sight of these top priorities. So I had shared that link in announcements in our Slack community. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can most certainly take a look at it. So now let's move over to mountain pose in our manual here, which is good stuff to dasana, that A um, is commonly silent, uh, although depending on the language preferences that you have, I'm certainly not stuck on it personally. Um, so here we find from our sky earths a breakdown of mountain before the arms rise, before we make that skyward reach. So again, much, much like Sammy, we have the hands forward, but in some lineages, we'll have the hands towards their thighs. No right or wrong. In fact, I don't even commonly cue it in my class because if a moment ago we decided our priorities are few and our to-do list is many, I don't know that where they put their hands matters enough to me to choose it as a cue. Maybe, maybe once in a while, you know, or if asked. Um, so some key things that we'll get out of mountain is we'll improve posture, strengthen the body as a whole while improving balance with the core engaged, kneecaps lifted and body lengthened, feel the power within during this pose. So going back to that dristi concept, going back to that pranayama concept, going back to that turning that attention in word, what's happening within your body and the interconnectedness of it all by, you know, the implication of the energy extending beyond the soles of your feet into the roots of the earth. So those are some, some things that you can, you can kind of take from and consider prior to moving into our upward facing salute. And these are edge 
terms I've coined. So as you reach the fingertips high, notice here with Kit that we have a nice softness through the base of the neck. And that was also talked about in mountain. So when we were in mountain, I would probably spend some good attention and top priority on the base of the neck is nice and soft. And then as we reach for the sky, I might sprinkle in a reminder, right? And here we talk about opens the rib cage to allow for a deep breath, relaxes the traps, connects from ground to sky in this mindful pose. And it really, really does, right? And so not only are we, are we grounding our feet to the earth, but we're also lifting our feet up away from the earth with that core uh, engagement because it's the core strength that helps hold us up, particularly in those balance postures. So that's something to just kind of keep an eye on and be mindful of. Uh, okay, so next we're gonna move into this monkey or this halfway up we commonly hear in sun salutations. And so once again, with the dress or baggy pants in a class, we're not sure what's happening with the knees, but we can see the heels, but not always. Some of the, some of the attire, you can't really see the heels. Uh, I like to have the heels on the ground for this one, particularly if the modification I offer up in forward fold is a bent knee to give a chance for a lengthening of the hamstring. And then that will start to show um, a development in the downward facing dog for folks that tend to bend their knees. Usually the reason for that is shorter hamstrings. So we wanna lengthen the hamstrings and, and not that short hamstrings are good or not good. It's that we're going for balanced muscle stru structure that wraps the skeletal system. So that's what we're trying for. And that's what our cues and our modifications are meant to do. So here, in the absence of blocks, Sammy has chosen to come up onto her fingertips. And I love this one because had she not done that, had she fixated on, I want my palms to touch the floor, then it quite likely would have been with bent knees. And as you can see with the dress, we have a nice cream line. There is no bend in the knee and we have an opportunity to strengthen those hamstrings. Now, let me tell you why that's so important. For the anatomy piece of that, short hamstrings commonly tug and pull on, on the low back. And remember when we talked about our, our pot of water and our pelvis being nice and neutral and not spilling forward and back? Imagine tight hamstrings and, and strong but lengthened quads in the front of the thighs we're going to end up with the, an uneven bowl of water. And with that subsequent discomfort or pain or body movement patterns that show up in other ways in our health through our lives over a given period of time. So with this one, I love reach the tops of the fingertips to the floor. And that's probably even the cue I would give even before I invited them into a forward fold. Let's hang out here with a nice flat back. So going back to that top priorities list, the top priority list is nice flat back. Couple reasons. One, I feel brings attention and awareness to keeping the core engaged. And that can go such a long way in providing that muscular structure and support that might minimize, you know, we were talking about the osteoporosis and potential, potential for little tiny fractures if that's, if that's present or whatever, or maybe even if there's any disc issues or bulges or bulges that wanna herniate or any of those things, you know, when we talk about a nice flat back, it helps position the student into a movement where the benefits outweigh the risks. And that's, that's definitely the platform for which this entire teacher training rests and from the place in which I teach you. So you can do that, you know, whatever, whatever makes your heart feel happy, you can do with that, absolutely. Uh, so here I would have liked, and maybe even the, in the next picture, the one after this, uh, a, a dristy, a gaze at the floor rather than a little up. 
And since I took about 200 pictures, that one might exist. This is where I got it because I wanted to highlight in this training the, the um, fingertips in absence of blocks, particularly if we're teaching like virtual classes or classes where, you know, community props are not available. <clears throat> for any of the reasons why that might be the case, most of us show up for class with fingertips, right? So here, another thing that we could do is invite the hands to the shins. And we saw that in our yoga snippets, right? Where our hands to the shins. Notice it's not on the kneecaps, but it's on the shins. So keeping, keeping an eye on that. And again, so some of those key things, those top priorities, if they didn't make the cut in one of the other postures, perhaps it could make the cut in um, threading in some of these postures here instead. So let's move on to the next one where Sammy moves into a forward fold. Okay, lovely. Rib cage is nice and open shoulders are naturally hanging out back and down they're not like pinching a pencil or anything like that there's a softness about it there's a availability for space for breath there's a softness through the traps i see this picture and i definitely see a release i see some added support by tenting those fingertips which is a really nice choice. I like that. I see softness within the elbows and I'm still seeing lengthening with the hamstrings, which is ideal. Allowing the heels to be on the ground. So we never want our practitioners to feel self-conscious that their heels are or are not on the ground, but we do want to provide a teaching methodology that moves things in that direction for all the reasons that I've already named, right? low back pain and so on. So, you know, from here, you could then invite practitioners to move into this based on what feels good that, to them. So a little bit of playtime here. Let's, let's take a moment and just explore this posture. Keep in mind, we already had a chance to lengthen the hamstrings in the last posture. So our top priorities for this posture may no longer be lengthen hamstrings. So that might mean that you can say, why don't we play around with this a little bit? And you know, at any time you can come back halfway up if that feels better for you, you know, if you've been upside down too long, because inversions and in, in low blood pressure or high blood pressure can get tricky. Glaucoma is also on that list. So uh, if we invite them, you know, feel free to maybe reach for the elbows. How does that feel for you? Let's explore that. Usually when they reach for the elbows, we start to see a little micro bend in the knee. So one cue typically yields into the another, which is nice. Um, but then you could even say, perhaps take a soft sway if that feels good for you. Or maybe if you want to, you know, tighten this up and reach for the back of your calves and snug in. What do you need? What, what do you need today? Do you need some grounding? Do you need grounding? Invite the soles of your feet to the earth, even if that means get a couple of blocks, bring the, bring the earth up because we're not growing longer limbs today in yoga class. Make a joke, be yourself, let your personality come out, right? So whatever that would sound like for you to say, make it sound like that, uh, invite them. Maybe you feel better. Maybe you feel better bending the knees quite a bit and just resting the belly on the thighs. Can I tell you that this is such a nurturing posture? And if you haven't had a chance to do it, I invite you to do it. It's almost halfway into chair, right? But we're, we're, we're snugging in. I don't know. It, it reminds me of, um, of, of, of a very nurturing, almost infant sort of natural body position that that is experienced so that's also quite lovely like you might really want to take a deep then at the knee invite the belly to the thigh that's what we're going for now and then once there maybe even the hands reach to the back of the calves how would that feel if you explored into that so make it consider yourself now with all the hats that yoga instructors wear one is a travel guide you know so to find that language you can google travel guides and 
see what they say in their ads and there's some language available for you that's just fun to play with and and just change up and so on so as we come back to our sky earth because this is our sequence up down up down up down right here we're talking about in the and the modification most commonly see will be the bend to the knees so this here is not an inexhaustible list which is why there's a place for notes I want you to consider it as like a word bank and hit up thesaurus.com to build on this. So I've just created a platform to get you going, to get you started, to get you teaching so that when we break out into groups and teach each other sky earths, it's kind of a no brainer. We're reaching towards a sky, we're coming halfway, we're ragdolling up. Feel free to take that bent knee. Through practice, we gain mastery. So those are some key things that we'll, we'll want to keep an eye on. Uh, so, okay. So from here, I am going to take a five minute break and I'm going to open it up to Q&A in our screen here. I'll share our daily schedule. And my invitation to you is be realistic with your daily schedule and not overbook yourself. And also a little bit of self-care is here. So that one's also real fun. So five minute break and then we shall resume. <laughs> 